Welcome to the fourth lecture on my vector calculus series where we will finally meet formally the third entity of the Holy Trinity, the curl. I am saying finally meet formally because we have already met the curl once. Remember in our very first lecture where we introduced a Nabla operator i del del x plus j del del y plus k del del z as something which acts on a scalar to give a vector field. And there we also said that once you have this operator, this vector valued operator, we can also use it on vector fields. And one of the applications that we could do is take what looks like a cross product of this Nabla operator with A, and this is what we call the curl of A. It is a new vector field whose components are given by del del y of az minus del del z of ay for the x component and so on. However, at the stage our introduction to the curl was primarily a formal thing. We had not really talked about what it means or how we could use it. That is what this lecture is about. What exactly does the curl mean and what kind of applications it can have? Let me remind you that the second member of our Holy Trinity, the divergence, was defined as the limiting value of flux through a surface divided by the volume across the surface. So basically divergence was a density of flux, so to speak. Curl actually plays a similar role. It is a density of something called circulation. So, in order to understand the curl, we will have to first understand what circulation is. Now, as the name implies, circulation basically originated from the idea of circulating objects, in particular circulating fluid. In a fluid, if you have liquid going round and round a particular point, then you have an example of a circulating fluid. Now, this is very, very common in our daily experience. If we were to, say, empty a sink, you would see liquid swirling around and going into the sink. So, this kind of vortices that form in liquids with a sink, that is, a point which drains the liquid out, it's very common in daily experience, and this is where our inspiration for the circulation comes in. Formally, the circulation of a vector field A over a contour gamma or a closed loop gamma, this has to be a closed loop, is defined to be the line integral of A with respect to L over the contour gamma, which, as the symbol here indicates, is a closed line. Let us see what this formal definition tells us about a vortex in a fluid. If you have velocity field in a fluid which looks like this, that is, the way the liquid locally moves in such a way that it's actually swirling around a particular point, then if we were to calculate the value for the circulation along this path gamma, what you are going to get is the circulation of the velocity vector about gamma. And that, if we were exactly the same in magnitude throughout, would simply have given you v into the length of the loop gamma, v into 2 pi r. Notice that in this case, v vector is at least roughly along the direction of dl everywhere. So along the segment of this path, so this is dl for us, this is our v, and because v everywhere is locally parallel to dl, or at least nearly parallel to dl, what we are going to get is v dot dl is almost v times dl, and since we are assuming that v more or less is fixed in magnitude throughout, v dot dl's integral over the entire line would be simply the magnitude of v taken out of the integral into the length of the entire curve, which is of course 2 pi r. So this would be the kind of circulation a vortex would lead to in a fluid. Now, vortices in a fluid may be a very dramatic 
visual example of a situation where you have circulation. But frankly, circulation as it stands is a very important object in other branches of physics as well. And you have all met this, for example, in mechanics. After all, if you have a force field and you do f dot dl and calculate the integral over any path, closed or not, what you are going to get essentially is the work done along the path gamma. And if this path happens to be a closed path, of course that gives you a work done. When you take a particle, move it all the way around in a closed path and bring it back to its original position. Now, if this force happens to belong to a special class of forces called conservative forces, then for conservative forces and conservative forces only, this line integral, no matter which curve you take, happens to take a value zero. So, circulation of a conservative force field about any gamma, any closed loop, must vanish. Now that doesn't mean that this is zero for any force field. This is a very special kind of force field that we are talking about, conservative force fields. And as you all know, at least I hope most of you already know, Conservative force fields are very important in mechanics because they are the ones which arise from potential energy and you can do a lot of nice calculations once you have got the potential energy in your corner. Of course, if the circulation of a force field along any given closed loop is not zero, then what you have is a non-conservative force. Now, this distinction between conservative and non-conservative forces play a very important role in electrodynamics. In electrostatics, the electric force, the electrostatic force that occurs between static charges happens to be a conservative force. And as a result, this force has zero circulation. And the electric field, which is basically this force acting on a unit charge, also has zero circulation. So in electrostatics, what we get is that the line integral of E dot dl over a closed loop is zero. And this is what we actually call potential difference. So this law, stated differently, says simply that if you were to track the potential in any closed loop, you are going to end up at the same value at the end as at the beginning. And this is what essentially becomes Kirchhoff's second law or Kirchhoff's voltage rule in circuit theory. Now this closed line integral of E dot dl over a closed loop has a special name. It's called electromotive force or EMF and in electrostatics this is actually zero. What makes this very very important is that it's not always zero. If you move away from electrostatics and move into dynamical situations, you have situations where there are magnetic fields and more importantly, these magnetic fields change with time, then you end up with an EMF which is non-zero. Indeed, this non-zero EMF should be familiar to most of you from high school. This is exactly what Faraday's law tells us, that if you have a change in flux in a surface bounded by a loop gamma, then the circulation of the electric field along this closed loop gamma, which is nothing but the EMF in this closed loop, happens to be equal to the negative rate of change of the flux of the magnetic field through the surface. The celebrated law due to Faraday, which essentially tells us how motion can lead to the generation of electricity. And this is, of course, what most of our modern civilization hinges upon for generation of electric power. Now that I have hopefully convinced you that the circulation of a vector field is an important quantity to look at, we can naturally ask this question. Can we talk about the rate at which a vector field A circulates at a given point P? Now, from our experience with the divergence, where we essentially were looking at the rate at which flux emerges from a point, we would want to take a look at the circulation in a loop which is very, very tiny 
and ultimately ends up enclosing only the point P. And in order to do that, we will start first with a very special kind of loop. This is a small planar loop gamma whose flat surface sigma, plus, after all, if it's a planar loop, there is a flat surface which is bounded by this loop, and this is flat surface contains the point P, as shown in this picture. The circulation of the vector field A about this particular loop gamma, CA gamma, contains information about the rates of circulation at all points on this surface sigma, which is bounded by gamma. Not just at the point P, but it would of course also tell you what the circulation is like everywhere on this surface sigma. Now, if we want to know specifically what is happening at the point P, what we have to do is of course shrink the loop gamma down to a really, really tiny one. One that in the limit has only the point P in it, as I've tried to show in this picture. Of course, this is just one stage of this shrinking. This still has many more points besides P in it, but as I keep on go making this loop smaller and smaller, I will ultimately hit a situation where only point P is there. But at that particular limit, the circulation CA gamma will also vanish because the loop has become infinitesimally small. So the value of the circulation of A around a very, very tiny loop which contains just P and nothing else will really not be that useful for us. What we need to do is divide it by something so that we can talk of the density of circulation, so to speak. Now, what do we divide it by? In order to understand that, let's think of first splitting this original loop gamma into two loops by adding this line in here so that this is how the loops end up splitting. So this one loop gamma which is going like that essentially now becomes two loops gamma 1 and gamma 2. Now it's easy to see that the circulation of the vector field A about gamma is nothing but the sum of these two circulations CA about gamma 1 and CA about gamma 2. When you calculate the line integral of A over the entire loop gamma, you are going to get the contribution from this part of gamma 1 and this part of gamma 2. But gamma 1 and gamma 2 have extra contributions coming from this part and this part respectively. But you must notice that these are actually the same line. I've just split them apart in order to show you what's happening. Now, the circulation, or rather the line integral of A about this part here and the line integral about this part here are actually negatives of each other. A is the same on both of these lines. Remember, these are exactly the same lines. But DL, the displacement vector along the curve is actually opposite to each other. So, the contribution of this part and this part would be exactly opposite to each other. So they would cancel in the sum, which is why CA gamma is CA gamma 1 plus CA gamma 2. And the surface area sigma that you have, the area bounded by this, is of course sum of sigma 1 and sigma 2. Now, we will not stop here. We will break the loop gamma into many, many more tiny loops by putting in more and more of these additional pieces. But it's again easy to see that the circulation of A along this outer loop gamma, CA gamma, is actually the sum of the circulation of all of these loops. So, CA gamma is the sum of CA gamma 1, CA gamma 2, up to CA gamma n, if we have divided up my bigger loop into n smaller loops. Of course, once again, you have many, many loops which contribute, but in all of these inner loops, have common faces. For example, this one has this face common with its neighbor and the contribution to the circulation from both of these common lines cancel out. So, if we are in a situation where the things are small enough 
so that basically the circulation the strength of circulation that we are looking for does not vary very much over neighboring regions then what we must have is this ca gamma is the sum of these n pieces each of which are roughly the same so each piece essentially goes like ca gamma by n and the area of each piece which remember added together gives you sigma now that you have n such pieces the area of each piece goes like sigma by n since both of them fall off to zero as n rises but they fall off to zero roughly at the same rate like 1 by n it follows that although the circulation through each small contour vanishes in the limit when the contour becomes very tiny so does the area enclosed by the contour the ratio of these two things both of which go like 1 by n is expected to approach a finite limit as this argument sort of makes it obvious this limit will be independent of the actual shape of the planar loop so we drew a nice ellipsoid but if you look at the pieces that i broke it up into this of course has many many different shapes and ultimately it shouldn't matter what shape the thing is in however the limit can definitely depend on which plane we have chosen so the orientation in space of the plane is very important here if you change the orientation you could definitely end up with a different value for this limit so what we define here is a quantity which will lead us to the curl but we are not calling it the curl yet in fact we have not reached the curl yet what we have at this stage is something like the surface density of circulation let me remind you one second what we are doing is we are considering a tiny loop gamma a closed loop which bounds a flat surface sigma like this and we are dividing the circulation of the vector field a that is the line integral of a dot dl about this closed line gamma by the area enclosed by this contour sigma and finally i'm taking the limit as sigma shrinks down to zero ensuring that the point p where we want to figure out this density is contained inside sigma and the sigma remember is a flat region so we can define a sigma vector which is equal to the area in magnitude and whose direction is given by the normal n hat and this density depends of course on the point p it definitely depends on which vector field we are talking about but it also depends on the orientation of this plane which means it depends on the normal n hat that we have chosen for the plane the one more important point and which is this there are actually two choices of the way in which we go around when we do a circulation calculation we could go around like this we could also go around like this at the same time there are two different choices for the normal i can take for the surface sigma which is we could go like this or we could go like this now in order that this limit makes sense as a very defined object what we need to do is we need to essentially say what is the n hat that we are associating with as we go around a loop am i talking about this one or am i talking about this one because remember we are going to say that ultimately ka this circulation density is something which depends not only on the point p but also which one of the two normals are we going to take this is dictated by a convention and the convention is called the right hand rule you all know what the rule is but let me repeat it once again the rule says that if you were to curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction of circulation that we have chosen the thumb of your right hand would point roughly in the direction of the normal that you have to take this is the right hand rule which has to be adhered to here so this gives us an idea about the strength of circulation circulation by unit area but unfortunately this gives us way too much information this will give us infinitely many numbers at every given point p because it will give me one number for each choice of n hat 
So different orientations of the plane will lead to different numbers. And that's way too many numbers to worry about. Question is, can we express this more economically with a smaller bunch of entities to worry about? And the answer is yes. Now, in order to understand this, what we will next talk about is an arbitrarily oriented surface. But as we have just said, the shape of this loop doesn't matter. So what we will do is we will take a triangular loop. In particular, we will take a loop which goes like this. So in the form of a triangle like this. Now, you can actually think of something like this. Instead of this particular loop, we can think of three loops. One which goes along the XZ plane, so goes up along the Z axis, then follows this line, then comes back, which is the curve that I've drawn in red here. That's the one in the XZ plane. I'm going to call that gamma 2. Gamma 2 because the XZ plane is essentially associated with, with this normal, which is J hat, the second vector. Gamma 1 will be the one which is normal to the i hat, the first vector. And there, what we are going to talk about is a piece which is in the yz plane. That is a, a loop which we'll get when you move from the origin along the y axis, then go back along this edge, then come back down. I've of course shown this slightly separated just to make things clear, but you have to realize that this orange line here and the black line should really coincide. And this orange loop that is what I'm going to call gamma 1. Similarly, you have a gamma 3, which is a piece you have when you move along the xy plane from the origin, move to this point, then move along our loop, then go back. Now, it is very easy to see that the circulation of a vector field A about gamma is actually going to be the sum of CA about gamma 1, CA about gamma 2, and CA about gamma 3. Of course, when you take these three loops individually, you have these three faces of my triangular loop, but you also have this line extra, this part extra, and this part extra. But these extra pieces are contributed from both Say, for example, this one is contributed both from gamma 1 and from gamma 2, and they are contributed exactly in opposition to each other. Same vector field, same line segment, you are traversing it in the opposite direction. So the contribution from this edge and this edge cancel, this edge and this edge cancel, this edge and this edge cancel. So you are only left with when you add up CA gamma 1, CA gamma 2, CA gamma 3, this red edge, this purple edge, and this orange edge, which together, of course, are the same as the three edges, which make up my loop gamma. So CA gamma is simply a sum of the three. And what about the surface area vector? Well, if the area enclosed by this loop is S, then the area enclosed by gamma 1, this area, S1, is simply nothing but the projection of S onto the YZ plane. And that is equal in area to S times the cosine of the angle between the normal to this vector N hat and the YZ plane, namely I. So, cosine of this particular angle. And that, of course, is nothing but the dot product of S with I hat. Similarly, S2 is the dot product of S vector with J hat. And similarly, S3 is S vector dot K hat. So, the circulation of A about my face gamma, which is oriented along a plane normal to N hat, is simply going to be a sum of these three circulations. And these three circulations are easily found out in terms of the surface densities about i, j, and k directions. So the surface density of A at the point P about i 
that times the area of the first uh, loop. That gives me C A gamma 1. Note that we are talking of a tiny enough loop that now we can replace the limit of the ratio by the ratio itself. So K A P I is actually the circulation of a loop normal to I by the area divided by that in the limit where the area goes to 0. I am just using a tiny enough loop so that there is no variation of KAPI inside the loop and you can multiply KAPI by the area to get the circulation. Similarly, you have KAPJ S2 for the circulation gamma 2, KAPK S3 for the circulation gamma 3. But now, notice that S1 is simply S dot I, this is simply S dot J, this is simply S dot K. So I can write this as KAPI I hat plus KAPJJ hat plus KAPK K hat dotted with S. So circulation about any arbitrary surface S can be written down in the form of this dotted with S. And now it's very easy to see what the surface density of circulation about any plane would be. It would simply be this quantity, this circulation divided by the area in the limit where the area is tiny, but we have already taken that limit in our calculation. So when you divide this by the magnitude of the area, S vector gets replaced by the unit vector in the direction of S vector, which is nothing but the normal to the plane. So ultimately, when we talk about the strength of circulation or the density of circulation in any plane, we essentially have to take this vector quantity and dot it with n hat, and that's all you really need. So these three numbers here, KAPI, KAPJ, and KAPK, these contain all the information you need about the rate of circulation at the point P. No matter which plane you want to put your flat loop in, you are going to be able to use a normal to the loop and these three numbers to calculate your final result. So this vector, the vector whose components are basically circulation in the yz plane, for example, for this one, circulation for a loop in the yz plane divided by the area in the limit where the area shrinks to zero. This is a circulation in the xy plane divided by the area. This is a circulation in the yz plane divided by the area. These three limiting numbers are all it takes. So all the information that you want about circulation at least at a point is there in, in these three numbers or effectively in this one vector. And this one vector is what is called the curl of the vector field A at the point P. So how do you define curl of A at the point P again? You define it simply by taking the limit of the circulation about a, about gamma, which is a boundary of sigma, divided by the area in the limit, of course, where the sigma shrinks down to zero, with the point P still inside sigma. This gives me the circulation density in a plane shared by the loop sigma. But that actually is going to be a vector curl of A at the point P dotted with n hat. So if you know the curl, you can use this to find out the surface density of circulation about any direction. On the other hand, if you want to calculate the curl, all you have to do is figure out all its three components. And for that, you just have to take the loops in the x, y, y, z, and z x planes. And they will give you the third, first, and second components of curl of A at the point P. Of course, what this gives is a vector curl of A at P at every point P. So curl of A itself is a vector field, something which gives me a vector at every point in a region. Of course, the natural question to ask here would be, why is this del cross A? And in order to see this, what we need to do is we need to calculate the components of curl of A as per this definition but using Cartesian coordinates. Remember once again, the shape of the loop will not matter. The orientation of the loop will. So to find out, say, the z component, we will have to take a loop in the xy plane. Its precise shape will not matter. But we will take, for our calculation, the simplest shape 
for a loop that we can put in the xy plane. And obviously, if we were using Cartesian coordinates, the simplest loop to use would be a rectangle with its edges parallel to the axis. To repeat, in order to find the z component of the curl of A at a point P with coordinates x and y, what we need to do is the following. We need to take a small loop gamma in the xy plane, enclosing the point P. So if the point P has coordinates x, y, we would take a loop with coordinates, let's say, x minus delta x by 2, y minus delta y by 2 as a starting point. Then we will move horizontally, parallel to the x-axis, so that x value changes but y value does not. And we land up at this point with x replaced by x plus delta x by 2. y, of course, retaining its original value, that is y minus delta y by 2. Then we go up, this time keeping a fixed value of x and changing only y to y plus delta y by 2. Then we move horizontally until at this corner, we land up with x plus delta x by 2. Sorry, x minus delta x by 2, x having changed. And y, of course, retaining the same value, y plus delta y by 2. And then finally, we have to go down, changing the y value back to y minus delta y by 2, the value I started out with. What we need to do is find the circulation CA in this closed loop gamma and then divide by the area enclosed by the loop, which of course is delta x times delta y. And once we do all this, we have to take the limit as the loop shrinks down to zero length on both its sides. That is, delta x goes to zero and delta y goes to zero. And the loop becomes smaller and smaller until it encloses only the point P and nothing else. Here I have shown this calculation in a bit more detail. And of course, because we are in the three-dimensional world, I have drawn all three axes, x, y, and z. But in this case, we are focusing on a loop in the x, y plane. Or could be parallel to the x, y plane. So this z could have a non-zero value, but it would have a same fixed value throughout. So you are starting from the point A, the point with coordinates x minus delta x by 2, y minus delta y by 2 then going to on to the point B, then to C, then to D, then to A. Now, in order to calculate this line integral, what we need to do is calculate the integral from A to B first, then from B to C, and so on. Let's talk about the part from A to B. Here, of course, when you're doing A dot DL, DL vector for this part is just dx times i hat. x is the only thing which is changing, and of course, the displacement is in the x direction, so in the direction of the unit vector i. So when I dot dl vector with a, what I am going to get is simply ax times dx, which is what is going to be integrated here. And the limit is going to be from x minus delta x by 2 to x plus delta x by 2. And that, at least for a very small loop, is going to be ax times delta x. The value of ax inside this piece times the length of the piece. Now this is for this particular line. For this one, you have to use dl vector which is minus dx into i hat. For this one, on the other hand, you would have to use dy into j hat. For this one, minus dy into j hat. But putting all of them together, it's pretty easy to see that the line integral of a dot dl over this entire loop, a, b, c, d, back to a, is actually going to have four pieces, ax delta x, as we have seen from this, minus ax delta x from this, plus ay delta y from this, and minus ay delta y from this. Of course, despite the fact that you have two ax delta x's with opposite signs, and two ay delta y's with opposite signs, you don't really end up with zero because the two ax delta x's are being evaluated at different positions. The plus ax delta x is evaluated where y is y minus delta y by 2, and the minus ax delta x, the one up here on the line cd, is evaluated at y 
being given by y plus delta y by 2. Similarly, the two ay delta y's are evaluated at different values. The difference between the two ay delta y terms is going to be there simply because ay is different on the two arms. In this case, the arms bc, which contributes this one, and the arm dA, which contributes this one. So what you get is Ay's change when you change x from x plus delta x by 2 to x minus delta x by 2, or rather the other way around. And that is simply del Ay del x times the change in x, which is of course delta x. And delta y is just a spectator here. It's, it's just there for the ride. It's an extra factor. Now, from the other two terms, the terms in green, you end up with this, minus del ax del y delta y times delta x. The minus sign comes from the fact that here, at a larger value of y, you have a negative term. So when you combine them together, you get del ay del x from here, minus del ax del y from here, times delta x delta y. Of course, both of these derivatives are actually evaluated at the point p. By the way, these are not the only terms that you get. You actually get higher order terms as well. In fact, when you first did the integral from a to b, and I just claimed this to be ax delta x, you should realize that although ax is being evaluated at a fixed value y minus delta y by 2, x changes here. So, when you say ax delta x, it's really not ax at p that's being used here. It's ax as it changes throughout. So, this is an approximate result. So, there are higher order corrections to this. Similarly, when you say the difference between, let's say, ay at x plus delta x by 2 and ay at x minus delta x by 2, is simply del ay del x delta x. That's really not true. We know that there are higher order contributions here as well. But whether you take the higher order contributions from the individual integral evaluations or higher order contributions from this difference, all these terms will always end up with factors like delta x squared delta y or delta x delta y squared or even higher powers of delta x and delta y. Remember, in order to find the curl or rather the z component of the curl, what you need to do is divide this circulation by the area, delta x, delta y, and then take the limit in which delta x and delta y go to zero. All these higher order terms will have at least one power of delta x or one power of delta y or higher powers after you do the division, which means when you take the limit as delta x, delta y goes to zero, these terms are all going to drop out, which means that we are only going to be left with this in the limit. And therefore, curl of A, the z component at P, is simply going to be given by del Ay del x minus del Ax del y at P. And if you remember the way in which the cross product is done, this is nothing but the z component of what you would get if you would did a cross product between the del operator and the A. Of course, evaluated at the point P. So this justifies for us the fact that curl of A is also written as del cross A. Of course, we have seen this only for the z component. We should, in principle, have verified this also for the x and the y. But it should be obvious that there is really no difference between the three axes here. You just relabel the axes and you can repeat the same proof for all of them. Now that we have established that curl of A can be written, at least for Cartesian coordinates, as del cross A, let us remind ourselves of the way in which we can simply remember what a cross product formula is like. This is a very handy mnemonic to use, where A cross B can be written down as a determinant. Here A and B are ordinary vectors with components AX, AY, AZ, and BX, BY, BZ respectively. All you do is write down the three basis vectors i, j, k on the top row of your determinant, the components of the vector a in the second row, and the components of the vector b in the third row. And when you evaluate this determinant, expand it out using the standard rules for determinant manipulation, you get all the components of a cross b. Now you can do something very similar 
for the curl. Because it is del cross A, the basic idea is, you can use exactly this kind of idea. You would write down a determinant where the first row is i, j, k, the basic vectors. The second row are the components of del, which remember are del del x, del del y, del del z. This is a huge difference by the way. These are operators, not numbers as in this case. And the final row will be the components of the vector field ax, ay, az. So, if we were to try to evaluate, let's say, the x component of curl of A, that is the coefficient of i in this expression, all you would do is use the standard rules for determinant manipulation, you would expand about the first row, and i will be multiplied by the cofactor, or rather by the minor given by this which is a signed cofactor, in this case the sign being 1. Now, one thing you have to be careful about, when you calculate, say, the x component of this, what you would do is the same thing, you would use a or i, then you would multiply a y b z and b y a z to find the minor, and the difference, of course, goes into the x component of a cross b, a y b z minus a z b y, but in this case, you could say either a y b z minus b y a z or a y b z minus a z b y. There is no real difference. Here you have to be careful. These being operators, the order here matters. And so the rule will always be in this so called product, you would always take the second row before the third row. So this will be del del y of az, and this term, the one with the negative sign, will not be a y del del z. Of course, that would be an operator, not a component of a vector field. But minus del del z of a y. So this is del a z del y del del y of az minus del del z of a y. And of course, by following the same rule, you can write down the other two components as well. This is a useful thing to remember because very often, the formula for the curl can tend to confuse people, especially with the issue of which terms have a plus sign, which ones have a minus sign. The determinant form is one nice way to remember this. But let me also warn you that this works as it stands only in Cartesian coordinates. In the next lecture, when we talk about general orthogonal coordinates or some special cases of those coordinates like spherical polar or cylindrical polar, we are going to see that this formula will need to be modified a bit. But now that we have basically met CAD, DIV and CURL, all the three members of the holy trinity of vector calculus, it is time to put them together, that is apply one after the other. Now, there are many, many ways in which you can put the grad diff curl together to get very interesting and important results. In the rest of today's lecture, I'm going to talk about only two such cases, two very important theorems, which have one thing in common. They both lead to zero as a final result. And that's really not surprising. In advanced mathematics, it turns out that these Two theorems are really two facets of the same theorem. But for the time being, let us take a look at the theorems first. The first of these theorems involve a smooth scalar field. Let's call this scalar field phi. When you say it's a smooth scalar field, you are implying that its derivatives exist. In particular, what we need here is that at least the derivatives up to second order exist and these derivatives are continuous. If that happens, then if you do the following on phi, you first apply the gradient on it to get a vector field, then apply a curl on the resulting vector field, you always get zero. That's the theorem. The second theorem involves a smooth vector field. Once again, smooth vector field essentially means that all the components of this vector field, ax, ay, az, are smooth functions. In particular, we need them to ha have at least second order partial derivatives 
and for these partial derivatives to be continuous. If on such a vector field you apply curl first to get another vector field and then you apply the divergence on the resulting vector field, you are again going to get a zero. Now these two equations actually look very similar and there is an underlying reason, a deeper reason for that. In advanced mathematical physics, you deal with things called differential forms. And there is an operation that you can do on differential forms, operation written simply as D, which has this fancy name exterior derivative. Now, I am not going to talk about differential forms and exterior derivatives in any detail today, except to tell you that the exterior derivative essentially is a way of combining these operations grad, div and curl together. Acting on different kind of differential forms, they give you effectively the gradient, the divergence and the curl. And this exterior derivative has a very important property. It squares to zero. That is, if you apply d twice, you end up with zero. In fact, curl grad phi and div curl a being zero, are simply special cases of d square being zero in the more general advanced mathematical physics version. So it's not a surprise that they both give you very similar results because at least in advanced mathematical physics, there are really two sides of the same coin, the same theorem, but because you are really not looking at the underlying unifying picture, you are looking at them as two different theorems. Be that as it may, mastering the theory of differential forms and the properties of the exterior derivative would take us way too long and is not really my topic today. So let's return to the world of ordinary mathematical physics, so to speak. At least the first course of mathematical physics, which we are following here, and try to prove these theorems using a very basic result about partial derivatives which is the following. If you have a function capital F of two variables x and y, and if you carry out the mixed partial derivatives, then you can of course do it in two different orders. The theorem says that as long as F has second order partial derivatives, and all these partial derivatives are continuous, that's very important. Mere existence is not enough the derivatives have to be continuous, then the mixed partial derivatives are equal. It does not matter which order you apply the derivatives in, you get the same value. Now, using this theorem from ordinary mathematics, let us prove our two theorems. Firstly, let's take a look at curl of grad phi. And this, of course, is a vector field which has three components. I'm going to just take a look at the z component. Curl of grad phi z component, according to the formula that we have just figured out, is going to be del del x of grad phi's y component minus del del y of grad phi's x component. Here, grad phi is the vector field A that we have used in our previous versions. Now, grad phi is a vector field with components del phi del x, del phi del y, and del phi del z. So, grad phi's y component is simply del phi del y. This one is simply del phi del x. So, this is two partial derivatives being done on phi one after the other. First, you do del del y, then you do del del x. That is exactly what we mean by the mixed partial derivative del 2 phi del x del y. This one is del 2 phi del y del x. And as I just said, as long as phi is a smooth function, that is... It has at least second order partial derivatives which are continuous. These two mixed partial derivatives will be equal. And therefore, you end up with zero as a difference. Well, this was only for the z component. But the proof for the other two components is also exactly similar. And there is no real, real need to repeat that. You can easily convince yourselves that all three components of curl grad phi will vanish. Now, what about the other theorem? Divergence of curl of A. Divergence of a vector 
or a vector field, remember, is del del x of the x component plus del del y of the y component plus del del z of the z component. So this is del del x of curl of a's x component plus del del y of curl of a's y component plus del del z of curl of a's z component. Now I can just put down the three components of curl of a from what we have learned a while ago. We are still using Cartesian corners, remember. Now, curl of A's x component is of course del A z del y minus del del z of A y. And similarly, you can write the other three things down. And you can see that in each case, you basically have a partial derivative in here. And then you are doing another partial derivative. That is, you are doing second order partial derivatives. And it's easy to check that all of these are mixed derivatives with respect to different variables. The first term here is going to be simply del 2 az del x del y. That comes with a plus sign. On the other hand, the same thing, except that the partial derivatives are being done in a different order, occurs here. Del del y of minus del az del x. That's minus del 2 az del y del x. And from the fact that all three components of a, ax, ay, az are smooth functions, we know that these two must cancel out. Very similarly, you can show that this term, which leads to this, and this term, which leads to this, gives you mixed partial derivatives in two different orders, again cancelling each other out, and same can be said about the remaining term. So divergence of curl of A is composed of six terms, which cancel each other out, and you are left with zero. So we have established these two very important theorems. Now at this point, I should sound a warning. What these theorems say, of course, is that curl of gradient of a scalar field, smooth scalar field, vanishes, and divergence of curl of a smooth vector field vanishes. It also can be rewritten in the form that if a vector field is a gradient of some scalar field, then its curl is zero. That's for the first theorem. Or for the second theorem, if a vector field is a curl of another vector field, then it has zero divergence. So far, so good. But physicists often pretend that the converse of these statements are also true. What is definitely true is that if A is grad phi, then curl of A is zero. Of course, assuming that phi is a smooth scalar field. What phases often assume is the converse. If curl of A is zero, then A is gradient of a scalar. Now, this happens to be very, very useful. After all, a vector field which has zero curl is very, very well known. Remember, all conservative forces have zero circulation. Net work done by the conservative forces, f dot dl's line integral, for a closed path will always vanish. So, since curl is nothing but circulation per unit area, for a conservative force, curl must vanish. But because curl vanishes, faces very often will just say that that gives you a sure shot proof that A is the gradient of a scalar. In fact, we do this in mechanics all the time and we introduce a scalar function whose gradient, or rather the negative of whose gradient, gives us a force. That scalar function is very, very important in physics. It's called the potential energy. But you have to realize that in order to do this, what we are actually doing is that we are using the converse of a theorem that we have proven. What we have proven, of course, is if a force is given by the gradient of a potential energy or negative of a gradient of a potential energy, it must have zero curl. What we are really using is because the conservative force has zero curl, it must be the gradient of a potential energy. Is this legitimate? The answer is almost all the time, but not always. Before I come to that, let's also point out that the other theorem 
also is sort of abused in the same way. What it really tells you is that if you have a vector field B, which is curl of another vector field A, then divergence of B is zero. But there is a vector field whose divergence is zero in physics. In fact, there are many vector fields whose divergence is zero in physics, but there's one which is very, very well known, which is the magnetic field. And the magnetic field, because it has zero divergence, faces often, in fact, almost always assume that you can write down B as the curl of another vector field. This other vector field is called the vector potential for magnetism. Now, once again, you notice that there is a logical gap here. If B is curl of A, then its divergence is definitely zero. But just because divergence of B is zero, you cannot necessarily say that B is curl of A. Again, this step, which faces very often use, is not strictly kosher mathematically. And there are situations where this will not work. In the situations where this will not work, that is, a zero divergence magnetic field may not be the curl of a vector field, or a zero curl force may not be the gradient of a potential energy. Such situations do exist, and in fact, such situations often lead to very interesting physical phenomena. But in most situations, you don't really have to worry about these fine details. In most situations, what physicists do naturally, pretend that the converse of these theorems are also valid, works at least to a very large extent. And so, at least at this level of exposition, we are going to assume that this is true. I just wanted to warn you that there are situations where these sort of obvious sounding assumptions would actually fail. And those are really very interesting situations, which you will meet in more advanced courses later on. For the time being, let me wrap up today's lecture. But let me promise you that we are going to return in the next lecture and talk about something which we have done with the divergence and repeating that for the curl. Just as an appetizer, let me remind you that because the divergence was essentially flux per unit volume, we could actually go back and calculate the flux through a large surface, large closed surface, in terms of a volume integral of divergence of the vector field in the region bounded by the surface. This was Gauss divergence theorem. A very similar thing can be done with the curl as well. Curl essentially, as we have seen, is circulation per unit area. It's a density, it's a kind of surface density. And just by reversing this, we can arrive at another celebrated theorem, so-called Stokes theorem, which relates the circulation for a large loop, which may or may not even be planar, to a surface integral of curl over a surface bounded by that loop. We are going to prove this theorem in the next lecture. But in case you are finding this similar to Gauss divergence theorem, once again, there is a deep underlying reason for that. Again, in the mathematical theory of differential forms, these two theorems are really the two sides of the same coin. There is a general theorem in this field. It is actually even called Stokes' theorem. And what we have called Gauss divergence theorem and Stokes' theorem are really two special cases of that more general theorem. But once again, that general theorem is really beyond the scope of this set of lectures. So we are not going to talk about that any longer. But we will come back to talk about the Stokes theorem in ordinary language in the next lecture. As well as talk about how to figure out curls components in other coordinate systems. Like spherical polar or cylindrical polar coordinate systems. But all that of course will have to wait for the next lecture. Bye for today.